Welcome to Dietetics After Dark, your source for food-related crime, scandal, and fraud. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. And I'm Becca. And you're listening to Dietetics After Dark. A very, very special episode of Dietetics After Dark. It's actually our season one finale. It's pretty bittersweet, but we are going on vacation. Yep. Dad's going on vacation. (laughs) We've got our socks, we've got our Birkenstocks, our fanny packs, and we're ready for the summer. Oh, that's right. But we're also going to spend the summer just building a bigger and better season two. And we honestly can't wait to do it and to share it with you. And I feel like this break, we've thought about it for a while. We almost did it before. And then we were like, no, we're having too much fun. We have to stick with it. But we're moving into the clinical portions of our master's practicum, so of our dietetic practicum. And we just don't want to burn out because we love creating dad and bringing you new episodes. And we have to protect that good energy. Yeah. And I feel like we're honestly pretty close to burnout right now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we will be back better than ever in September. We have the hugest list of amazing topics for next season that are just so scandalous. I honestly think that they might be even more scandalous in this season. So don't cry. We will be back. (laughs) And if you have recently found this podcast, I know that this news might be heartbreaking to you, but don't worry. You still have like 29 episodes to catch up on. Mm -hmm. And I just, before we move into the story of the day, I want to get a little sentimental because it's just crazy that this podcast started from Becca and I texting last September, and now it's become so much more than we ever imagined. It was a pandemic project that has now become our actual baby, Mm -hmm. like a total passion project. And it's taken a lot of time and energy, but I honestly, I wouldn't change a thing. I honestly, I don't know if people realize that every episode is at least 10 pages of research and writing. It's something that we really love to do because it's something that we obviously really enjoy investigating. But man, does it take a lot of effort. It does. And I I don't want it to sound like we're complaining. No, we totally love it. (laughs) And we've had so many moments when we're like high with excitement. We just got a message the other day that someone told us that they listened to the podcast while road tripping across Western Australia. Like that to me is the coolest thing ever. But we've also had moments where we want to have a breakdown (laughs) after 12 hours of research and writing and screen time. But honestly, I wouldn't change a single second of it. And I'm so excited for season two. Me too. And yeah, I think I can speak for both of us when I say that this would be our ideal dream job. So dream job, true dream job. But yeah, if you if you love listening, it would mean the world to us if you could just spread the word about dietetics after dark to your true crime loving friends or leave a review if you haven't already. Season one has just been so much fun and can't wait for season two to begin. And we're not even technically done season one yet. (laughs) Yeah, we still have to record this episode. (laughs) So thank you so much, everyone, for all your support. We love you. And Becca, let's move on before I start to cry. Okay, let's (laughs) get into it. (laughs) The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. If you're interested in medical nutrition therapy or personalized nutrition advice, please talk to a registered dietitian in your area. All the citations and relevant links for anything mentioned in this episode will be in our show notes. This podcast may contain coarse language and mature subject matter. Listener discretion is advised. This is an independently produced podcast. If you could rate, review, and subscribe, that would really help us out, and we will be forever grateful. Okay, so today, Becca is going to give us the history of an all-American treat, the iconic Twinkie. And then in honor of Pride Month, I'm going to talk about the assassination of the first openly gay elected official in California, Harvey Milk and the trial that became well-known for its use of the Twinkie defense. I am so excited about this one because I have obviously heard of Harvey Milk, but I don't know much about this trial or the defense or how Twinkies are really involved in it. <laughs> it's pretty infuriating, to be honest. So we'll, we'll get into it. I'm not going to spoil anything yet. All right, I'm buckling up. 
let's start at the very beginning with the invention of the Twinkie. So in 1849, a man by the name of Robert B. Ward opened a small bakery in Lower Manhattan, which was later called Continental Baking. They specialized in breads, cakes, and other wholesale baked goods. And in 1925, so over 75 years later, Ward's grandson acquired a bakery from Indianapolis called Taggart Baking, which was making Wonder Bread products at this time. These included breads, obviously, and Hostess Cakes. So you might remember from our organics episode, in 1930, the first sliced bread machine was invented in Missouri, and the Wonder Bread Company began using this technology nationwide. And I honestly, I love how all of our stories have so many connections to previous episodes. It's so intertwined. It's amazing. It is. And it's it's starting to happen more and more. The more episodes we do, another episode that you haven't mentioned yet comes up in my part too. Oh, perfect. <laughs> it's like we're promoting all of our episodes in our future episodes. Yeah, it might get annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So one interesting and somewhat unrelated fact that I found about the sliced bread stuff is that the U.S. actually banned sliced bread for a period of time during World War II to conserve wax paper, which I assume must have been used between the slices that at the time. such a fun fact. I had no idea. I, I wonder if that's where the saying originated from. Like, you know, when they finally were like, okay, you can start producing sliced bread again. Everyone was like, oh, this is amazing. And then they made that saying. Whatever the saying is, because it's, I'm blanking. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a possibility. Okay. So around the same time, so we're still in the 1930s, the Continental Baking location in Illinois, because they had expanded, they had a bunch of shortbread pans that they weren't using for their seasonal strawberry shortcakes as strawberries were out of season. The manager, James A. Dewar, decided that he was going to try making shortcakes with the pans using a banana cream filling instead of the strawberry one. And it turns out they were delicious. There was a billboard near the bakery that advertised for Twinkle Toe shoes, which I thought were those light up kids shoes, but those weren't actually invented until 1992. I was going to say the 1930s. That seems a little little early. I got ahead of myself. And then I realized that they're LED lights in those shoes. (laughs) Anyways, Dewar, he got crafty with the name Twinkle Toe, and he came up with the name Twinkie for his new cakes. But I do wonder if he regretted not naming them after himself, considering their success. But maybe their success is in part due to the fun name. I know. I was thinking, like, would they be as successful if they were called James Cakes? (laughs) Dewar's. Dewar's. Both good suggestions. So most people are familiar with the classic vanilla cream filled Twinkie, but banana flavored filling is the original. No way. You see what? That is so wild. Yeah, way. Does it still exist? Will you tell me? I will tell you. You see, what happened was during World War II, all banana imports stopped. So the company was forced to get creative again and the vanilla Twinkie was born. This Twinkie, which was the one that we all know and love today, It's the standard four inch long, one half inch wide yellow sponge cake with three globs of vanilla cream distributed throughout it. At the time of their creation, they were made with like fresh butter, cream, and eggs, giving them a very short shelf life of only about two days. So this quick turnover meant that a lot of Twinkies would be wasted on days and weeks where the demand was lower. So Dewar, he decided to reformulate the recipe. There are now 39 ingredients in the product, which has led some people to believe that they have an infinitely long shelf life, which isn't actually true. So today, the shelf life is only about 25 days, and much of that is actually due to the airtight packaging rather than the ingredients. 25 days seems short to me. It seems short to me too, Hmm. but I checked a few sources on that one. I trust you. So with that many ingredients, you would think that they would at least have tried to fortify the cake like a little bit, especially since it's a snack that tends to be promoted to youth. But unfortunately, it is pretty worthless when it comes to its nutritional value. So a serving of two cakes contains 6% of your daily iron intake, but that's about Mm -hmm. it. So there's no fiber or other micronutrients in addition to iron but a serving does contain 32 grams of sugar and four grams or 20% of your daily saturated fat intake. Mm. So it's a treat. And it's something that can definitely be enjoyed as a part of a healthy diet, but you couldn't physically live off of just Twinkies. And 
they aren't pumped with preservatives either. Almost all of their ingredients are replacements for the original ingredients as to help the cake from spoiling. So for instance, oils are used to replace butter. Uh, There are very few ingredients that are used to retain the freshness, and the main one is sorbic acid, which is naturally occurring. Hmm. I would love to try an original Twinkie. Like the butter, sugar. Yeah, maybe banana, but even just the original vanilla Twinkie that had just like butter, sugar, cream, like with the classic ingredients. I had this grand plan if I had time this week, which I didn't, (laughs) or this yesterday, (laughs) That I was going to make homemade Twinkies. That would have been awesome. And I was thinking it would be amazing if I could have brought one over to you, but just none of that happened. You shouldn't have told (laughs) me because now I'm heartbroken. That would have been so fun. I'm so sorry. I was looking up recipes for them and they looked incredible. Oh, they sound great. Cake and vanilla Mm -hmm. cream. How can you go wrong? You can't. But anyways, I found this article that breaks down how each ingredient is used in the Twinkie making process and essentially what its purpose is. And I thought this was really cool, but I'm not going to bore you with the details of all 39 ingredients. I will link it in our show notes though. So it's from a website called howstuffworks.com in case anyone does want to have a look at it. So today there have been about 17 variations of Twinkies, but of course not all of them are still in circulation. So some of the strangest flavors include orange cream pop, cotton candy, and white peppermint. Mm. But apparently the like the last source I could find said that the banana Twinkie lives on. I couldn't find it on the hostess website and I'm going to get into why I think this might be or what may have happened okay. later on. Okay. Anyways, Twinkies have been a staple in pop culture but have also been involved in some scandal which I know you will get more into. One other Twinkie-based scandal was Twinkiegate. And I know how much we both love scandals that play on the words of Watergate, Mm -hmm. so I had to bring it up. Horsegate. (laughs) Horsegate. Buttergate. Buttergate, yeah. (laughs) Did you read about this one in your research? No, I actually didn't. I'm disappointed. It's very brief. Okay. Very brief. But in 1985, a man running for Minneapolis City Council was indicted for bribery after he served his constituents Twinkies. So the charges were eventually dropped but it forced the creation of a campaign finance law known as the Twinkie Law, which was later repealed in 1988. Interesting. So it was a very short-lived law. Very short-lived. I actually don't know why they repealed it. Mm -hmm. It would have been probably kind of boring to look that up, so I just did it. (laughs) So unrelated to this scandal, in 1999, President Bill Clinton added a Twinkie to the millennial time capsule to represent American food culture. I love that. And this naturally had people questioning the shelf life of Twinkies again, mm-hmm. because why would you put something that is going to go bad in a 25 time capsule? days, <laughs> three weeks yeah. into the time capsule? <laughs> yeah. So I don't really know what the logic was behind that. I wonder, like, I wonder if it'll still be like in contact. Will it like have molded? Will it be hard as rock? I know. I'm really curious as well. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I guess we'll find yeah, out in what, a thousand years? Is that when they're opening the time capsule? We'll go with a thousand years. Yeah. I feel like they're going to open it in the next millennium. Okay. Yeah. That would make sense, right? That would make sense. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense. We're leaving a lot to the imagination this episode. (laughs) I know. I love how we're not saying fact check. Yeah. We're just like, there's not (laughs) going to be time. (laughs) Well, if you already tried. No, I I did look this up and I couldn't find anything that specifically said it might, it might be like on a government website, but I could not find it. I usually only yell fact check if it's something that I didn't think of. Like if you ask me a question, mm-hmm. then I'm like, oh, I could look that up. Okay. Back to the story. So to address consumer and scientific questions about the little cakes, so for instance, about their shelf life and all of that, mm. the Twinkies project was created. So Twinkies, in this case, is an acronym for tests with inorganic noxious cakes in extreme situations. And this group performs scientific experiments to determine the properties of Twinkies. So like their solubility, electrical resistance, density, radioactivity, and oxidation properties. And this is just a third-party group or it was set up by the Twinkies company, Hostess? No, it wasn't set up by Hostess. It's just a bunch of like Twinkie-loving scientists (laughs) and they'll, I think they had, so they had a website that was ongoing and it was taken down recently. So I don't know if they're still doing their scientific experiments 
but I think that they would showcase them for like kids and, and people who also love Twinkies. That is so interesting. I feel like because like Twinkies are the quintessential processed food. Yes. They're even just used as the example of like if someone was like, oh, we're talking about ultra highly processed foods like Twinkies. It would mm-hmm. be the example. Yeah, no, you're right. Hmm. And I feel like this kind of plays in to why in 2012 Hostess filed for bankruptcy. Hmm. So Twinkies were actually removed from store shelves for a few months after this. And there was a huge bidding war for the brand, naturally. And a year following, they were purchased by a company for $410 million. Mm, Wow. And this deal included the Twinkies, but also Ding Dongs, Ho-Hos, Snowballs, and Zingers. I haven't had any of those. I've only ever had a Twinkie. Yeah, no, same here. I don't even know if they sell those in Canada. I don't even know what a zinger is. I can picture a snowball. I think it has coconut over it. It does. Yeah. I can't picture a ding dong or a ho-ho. Me neither. (laughs) We'll have to look up some pictures of these. Yeah. Future editing Becca here. In all the excitement for Sarah's story, I completely forgot to share my thoughts on what may have happened to the banana Twinkie. So in 2007, they became a staple flavor. However, as I mentioned, with the company's bankruptcy, they changed ownership. When looking up the flavor online, very few results came up, so I thought that they may have been discontinued at the time of this recording. However, after further investigation and contacting my American snack source, I found out that they are, in fact, still in circulation. But then I figured I would finish my section off by just giving a shout out to the individual who's eaten the most Twinkies on record in the world, and that is a man by the name of Lewis Browning who was a retired milk truck driver. And in 2005, he had eaten an estimated 22,000 Twinkies. So one to two Twinkies a day for about 64 years. Oh my goodness. That is kind of impressive. Like (laughs) uh, he's a man of routine. (laughs) Definitely. My brother's a milk truck driver. Oh, is he? I'm going to ask him if he eats uh, Twinkies. Yeah. My little brother. Yeah. What is his favorite snack, his road snack. I think it's just a classic double-double. Sam, I know you listen. You're going to have to let me know. Hey, this is Sarah's brother, Sam, the milk truck driver. Thanks for the shout-out. I'd say my favorite road snacks would be sun chips or chocolate-covered raisins. Thanks again. Thank you, Sam. So no Twinkies, but sun chips and chocolate-covered raisins are excellent choices. (laughs) That was really interesting. Twinkies have such a a loaded history. I feel like a lot of our brands, and this is something we've learned, of course, throughout producing this podcast, but a lot of our favorite brands have a pretty interesting history. Everyone has a story, even Twinkies. Even Twinkies. Okay. So on that note, I think I'll start telling you about one of the most interesting uses of the Twinkie, the Twinkie defense. And Actually, one of the most interesting things about the Twinkie defense is that it never actually happened, (laughs) right? I know, at least not in the way that the public thought that it did. So this is a textbook case of media headlines exaggerating and swaying the court of public opinion. But the story behind how that came to be and the logic behind the Twinkie defense is fascinating. So do you feel confused? (laughs) A little bit. I feel like I might, like, I feel like just based on what you said, it sounds like the media took things out of proportion, Mm -hmm. came up with a name for something that might not have even really happened, being used or being true or Mm -hmm. what have you. Yeah, what have you. Yeah, I guess I'm a little bit confused. And this was (laughs) such a high profile case and like the name Twinkie Defense, that would just catch on like wildfire. It's such a good name. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what happened. So we are going to start with the terrible part. Dan White was an all-American man. He was a handsome family man that had served in the army, fought in Vietnam, and then worked as a policeman and firefighter before transitioning to politics. He joined the local San Francisco government as a city supervisor in January of 1978, and only 11 months later, on November 10th, he suddenly resigned from that same job. He cited the slow workings of city government and the low salary as his primary reasons for resignation. This was very out of character for White, and the public employees who had worked really hard to get him elected were upset, of course, and 
They vocally objected to his decision to quit. The mayor at the time, George Moscone, faced the politically charged job of appointing his successor, which had the potential to tip the power balance on the board. Uh, This seat in question was in a more conservative district. So white supporters pressured him to revoke his resignation and ask for his job back, which white actually did within the week. And at the exact same time, some of White's former colleagues, most notably Harvey Milk, encouraged Mayor Moscone to not reappoint White, creating a growing tension within the board. So we're starting off with some political tension here. Harvey Milk was the first openly gay elected official in California and a leading political activist for the gay community. There is a wonderful movie about him called Milk, starring Sean Penn. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. I I downloaded it on my DC++ in university, (laughs) and I did not watch it. But it's one that I would love to watch. Yeah, it's And I probably will now that I've been reminded of it. It's a great movie. It's a total tearjerker. I highly recommend. Okay. So Harvey Milk fought hard for gay rights at a time when they were under direct attack. And he also fought for the civil and economic rights of many marginalized communities like the Asian community, African-Americans, Latinos, and senior citizens. Milk had unsuccessfully ran for office three times before his theatrical campaigns actually helped make him more and more popular. And after a long political battle, he finally took office on January 28, 1978, as a city supervisor alongside Dan White. Dan White and Harvey Milk were not always at odds with each other. So they were actually both Democrats working under Dianne Feinstein, who is the current senator of California. And she's been, she's held that seat since 1992. It's impressive. It is impressive. She is so impressive in this story. I don't, I honestly don't know too much about her, but after this story, I feel like I'm a fan. So at the time, there was this absolutely terrible bill called Proposition 6, or the Briggs Initiative, That was sponsored by a California state senator, and this bill would have made it not just legal, but mandatory to fire gay teachers and any public school officials that supported gay rights, which is just that's absolutely terrible. And not that long ago. Not that long ago. This is 1978. So both White and Milk voted against the bill, and it ultimately didn't pass, thank goodness. And one source I read said that Milk and White would even have lunch or coffee together occasionally, and Milk even attended White's son's christening. But there were other areas in which White and Milk began to clash. Milk reversed his support for White's efforts to keep a home for troubled youth out of his district, and possibly as a retaliation, White reversed his support for a gay rights measure that was important to Harvey Milk. One quote Mm -hmm. from an article by Daniel Flynn in the City Journal said, quote, Milk perhaps never saw White as an ally, but White clearly saw Milk as such, which led to feelings of betrayal. So fast forward to November 10th, 1978, and White hands in his sudden resignation, and then within a week asks for his job back. He, you know, he's a family man, he has a family to support, and he's probably feeling like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I quit. Plus, he was facing pressure from... Uh, his political allies to ask for his job back. And Mayor Moscone was initially going to welcome White back on the board, but he reversed his decision last minute after Harvey Milk and some others lobbied against it. Oh, so there were other people and also yes. this mayor yes. took this yeah, tough into decision. consideration. Okay. Dan White felt very betrayed. And if you look at his personal life around this time, negative feelings had been brewing for a very long time. So people had begun to notice changes in his usually sunny disposition. He was typically very into health and fitness, but over the past few months, he'd changed his diet to include primarily highly processed foods, and he had also stopped working out. So you can just put a little bookmark on that fact because we're going to be coming back to it. So the atmosphere is tense, and there is some evidence that Dan White's mental health had been declining for some time. And now he's also been told he can't have his job back, even though he has his family at home to support. And from his perspective, it's because a friend lobbied against his return to the board. So do we know exactly why he left the job in the first place? Yeah, he said it was because of the slow workings of city government and also because of the low salary. 
which was about $9,000 on the year. But do you think that that's really why he left? I think he was also struggling with depression. Okay. So I think it was just a combination of factors. He was pretty new to politics and he'd been in the army before. He'd been a policeman. He'd be a firefighter. Maybe it was just not something he enjoyed. Okay. I was wondering if there was like some underlying other reason why he had left. I don't think so. Or maybe not. On November 27th, 1978, Dan White had a friend drive him to the San Francisco City Hall on the very same day that Mayor Moscone was planning to appoint the new board member. White was carrying two guns, one with hollow bullets, which are more lethal. They actually expand upon contact with soft tissue, so that was an intentional choice to use those bullets, and his service revolver from his work as a police officer. White snuck into City Hall through a window so that he could avoid the metal detectors, and he went directly to Mayor Moscone's office. And Moscone could immediately sense that White was angry, and he asked if they could retreat to a private lounge to chat further where others couldn't hear them. And so they did, and as Moscone poured two drinks for them, White pulled out the revolver and shot him in the shoulder and the chest from a distance. And then White walked right up to Moscone and put two bullets in his head, point blank. Wow. Yeah. That's overkill. That is overkill, exactly. And as White exited the office, he ran into Diane Feinstein, who called after him, but White responded, I have something to do first. She got lucky. Yeah, she got lucky. So White proceeded towards his former office, and on the way there, he ran into Harvey Milk, and he asked Milk to step into the office with him. Milk agreed and entered the office, where he repeated essentially the same assassination. So multiple shots from a close-range distance, and then a final very close-range shot to the head. Diane Feinstein had followed them into the office, and she rushed into the room to check Milk's neck for a pulse. She was so badly shaken that she required physical support from police officers, but she was able to muster the strength to announce the murders to the public shortly after, and this is her quote. As president of the Board of Supervisors, it is my duty to make this announcement. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. The suspect is Dan White. Wow. Yeah. So pretty crazy. The coroner who later worked on Moscone and Milk's bodies said that they most likely would have survived the first round of shots, but it was the deliberate, close-range shots to the head that brought instant death. Diane Feinstein was promoted to mayor after Mayor Moscone's death, becoming the first female mayor to serve in that office. So one tiny positive, I guess, at the end of that absolutely terrible story. And so now at this point, you might be wondering, mm -hmm. where does the food come in? So Dan White was arrested and charged with first degree murder with special circumstance, which potentially carried the death penalty in California at this time. And as you can probably imagine, with two high-profile victims, this trial was sensational. Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk had many supporters. Milk was a hero to many at the start of his political career. And Moscone was lovingly called the people's mayor. And this crime was absolutely devastating. Dan White's legal team had a terrible job ahead of them. They had to defend an admitted double assassin that had brought two guns into City Hall, fired at extremely close range, and had been seen by multiple witnesses at the scene of the crime. So the lawyers needed to get creative, and this is where the Twinkie defense comes in. So the lawyers did get creative, but not quite as creative as some people think. So many people believe that White's lawyers argued that White was eating so many Twinkies and other high-sugar, ultra-processed foods leading up to the assassinations that his diet actually caused psychological and physiological changes that led him to act in a way that was inconsistent with his normal behavior. And to paraphrase mm. that, many people thought that the Twinkies made him do it, basically. It's an interesting defense. It is. That's not, that's not what they did, though. That's what people thought they, they did. did. Yes. Okay. So people thought that essentially the defense was arguing that he ate so many Twinkies that it changed his behavior. Okay. And this is only the half-truth, because what the lawyers actually argued is that he had a diminished capacity due to his depression, as evidenced by changes in his personality and demeanor that included diet, lifestyle, and mood changes. 
Okay, so it was a small fraction of their defense. Yes. But I kind of wonder, just based on the nutritional quality of Twinkies, Mm -hmm. if you were eating Twinkies exclusively, you would likely be malnourished. Yes. Which might change your brain composition. Totally. He wasn't eating Twinkies exclusively. So Twinkies were actually only mentioned in a passing comment. But it was really this oh, and transition grabbed onto it and people latched onto it. <laughs> but he was eating a diet that was very heavy and highly processed foods. So could he have had a nutrition deficiency? Possibly. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk a little bit about some research that's been done at the very end. Yeah, I'm not saying that that's a defense. Malnourishment for murder. <laughs> yeah, for but sure. I just thought that it was interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> Psychiatrist Dr. Martin Blinder was called to testify in court, and he testified that Dan White was depressed, as evidenced by the conversion of the previously health-conscious man into someone who had a diet of Twinkies and other junk foods. So not exclusively Twinkies, but definitely a highly processed diet. Twinkies and Ho-Hos. Twinkies, Ho-Hos, Ding Dongs, Snowballs, whatever the other one was that we don't know. (laughs) Zingers. Zingers. Snopes.com, we love Snopes, I had a great analogy as to why this statement has been misinterpreted. So I'm going to read this direct quote from Snopes. This testimony was similar to offering evidence that the habitual wearing of torn and dirty clothes by someone who had previously always been a snappy dresser was a sign that the person was suffering from depression. Nobody who paid attention would claim that such a testimony asserted that bad clothing caused the defendant's depression. But that's exactly what happened in White's case. Interesting. It is interesting. So people misinterpreted the defense as suggesting that Twinkies had caused the depression instead of just being one symptom of it or one evidence of his depression. Dr. Blinder did at one point suggest that excessive sugar could aggravate a pre-existing chemical imbalance in the brain. But it was only in a passing comment and it was not a significant part of the defense. But the public was absolutely led to believe that Twinkie consumption was the basis of this defense. So in a moment, I'm going to read you some snippets from the media, but some of them have spoilers. So first, I have to share the upsetting and shocking outcome of the trial. Okay, Dan White was only convicted of voluntary manslaughter, the lightest possible sentence in this case. Despite the fact that White had brought two loaded guns with hollow bullets, snuck into City Hall through a window, avoided security and bodyguards, and reloaded after killing Mayor Moscone, walked across City Hall to find Harvey Milk, and then shot both victims multiple times at close range, the jury found that White's actions were not premeditated, largely due to this defense. What? I know. Those lawyers must have been overjoyed. I cannot yeah. believe that. Yep. And just you re- reiterating those facts too is like shocking. To I know. Me. I know. And, you know, you're not the only one that was shocked. To say that people were furious is an understatement. And part of why the Twinkie defense myth took hold is that many found it hard to believe that a rational jury of their peers could find Dan White not guilty of premeditated murder. And so the facts were twisted to a story about how, you know, a slick lawyer had used an absurd Twinkie defense and got him off. Gotcha. The public was outraged, and this verdict actually sparked the White Knight Riots. So the White Knight Riots were a series of events that took place on the evening of Dan White's conviction of manslaughter. So May 21st, 1979, and incidentally, the very next night, May 22nd, would have been Milk's 49th birthday. Oh, The city's gay community was protesting the verdict, and uh, this was said to be the largest display of anger and protest by the gay community since the 1969 Stonewall Riots in New York City. So huge protests. Mm. White's status as a former police officer only enraged the tensions, of course. And the protests started as a peaceful march and escalated to hundreds of thousands of dollars in property damage, specifically to City Hall, and many injuries to both police officers and rioters. Dan White, this is a really sad story. (laughs) Like, overall, everything that happened from start to finish, there's not really a positive. Dan White served five years of his seven-year prison sentence, and then less than two years after his release from prison, 
he returned to San Francisco where he died by suicide. Oh, yeah, it is tough. Yeah, so just a really sad story all around. So here are some of the misleading media statements that caused the public to have a bit of a warped perception of the Twinkie defense. So White got off with voluntary manslaughter. The defense had argued that the refined sugar in White's junk food had made him depressed and mentally incapable of premeditated murder. So that was one quote. And then another one, his attorneys mounted what came to be known as the Twinkie defense, in which he argued that he suffered from diminished capacity because of the excessive amounts of junk food he consumed. So these are like very small language tweaks. I mean, they did argue he had diminished capacity, but not because of the junk food. Right. Yeah. So language matters. (laughs) It truly does. And I feel like Like, I wouldn't really even pick up on this unless I had all of the facts of the case. I wouldn't really question it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Totally. So it's so sneaky, and it really intrigues you to want to read the article. Yep, absolutely. It sounds so absurd. Like, if you saw this sensational case and this guy got off with a Twinkie defense, it's just, yeah, it's absurd and unbelievable that you just might believe it. It's very clickbaity. So in summary of the Twinkie defense, junk food and Twinkies specifically were used as evidence that White was depressed. White's depression was used to establish the grounds for the diminished capacity plea. And therefore, White was judged incapable of premeditation required for a murder conviction. But no one ever claimed that eating cream-filled snack cakes put White into a sugar-induced rage that drove him to kill. It's interesting. It it sounds like there was clearly something off. Yeah. About him. If he was, seemed like a decent guy beforehand. Absolutely. He also fought in Vietnam for years and years. Maybe he had some sort okay. of PTSD and then he was in, and then he was a firefighter and then he was a policeman and then he got into politics. Yeah, that's a lot. And this is 1978. It wasn't, you know, therapy culture wasn't what it is now. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Who knows what he was struggling with, but it's still so, so terrible. And since this time, the diminished capacity defense has actually been used in many different variations. So most commonly with caffeine, cough syrup, and or alcohol or a combination of the two, alcohol and cough syrup is a common diminished capacity defense. And also some food things that I'm not going to reveal because I think they could make some really good season two content. Well, I hope you tell me about them later. (laughs) Yeah, we'll we'll text. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so to finish off, I do want to talk a little bit about the link between sugar and depression. So the defense argued that White had depression already, as evidenced by his consumption of Twinkies. But there was a comment made by Dr. Blinder that excessive sugar could have aggravated a chemical imbalance in the brain. So is there any evidence to support that? I really like where you're going with this. I'm (laughs) interested to know what you came up with. Well, there is some evidence to support a correlation or an association between depression and sugar intake, but not a direct causation. Okay. So studies have shown that high consumption of soft drinks, added sugars, and low quality carbohydrates can increase the risk of depression. And a dietary pattern characterized by high intakes of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fish, olive oil, low fat dairy, and antioxidants, and also low intakes of animal foods is associated with a decreased risk of depression. And as we learned in the intro you wrote, Becca, to nutrition research in the Minnesota Starvation Study episode, Mm -hmm. it's challenging to definitively link one nutrient or like one isolated component of a food to a chronic condition, especially a chronic condition like depression that typically develops from a multitude of different genetic and environmental factors. Right. So it's not like he was eating just sugar. So it's very hard to say sugar causes depression because nobody really eats just exclusively sugar. For sure. Even, I mean, fat was likely a a part, like Mm -hmm. saturated fats were likely a part of that diet. Yeah. Salt, Mm -hmm. lots of items. And that's, I mean, that's even just focusing on nutrition, but then there's all those environmental factors you're talking about. Genetic as well. Genetic. Genetics load the trigger, environment pulls the gun. Mm -hmm. So while a low quality diet might, play a role in one person's mental illness, it might play a limited role in another person's mental illness. 
And so we aren't able to say, you know, sugar causes depression or they're depressed because they're eating sugar. But the evidence does support a statement like diets lower in processed foods and higher in fruits, vegetables, and other whole foods are associated with lower rates of overall depression. I like that. Yeah, thank you. It's a good conclusion. And you also... Good concluding statement. Thanks. Not quite done. But I'm sorry, you haven't concluded. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still concluding. It's an ongoing conclusion. Because you also have to consider what comes first, the depression or the lower quality diet. Because someone who is depressed is very likely going to be reaching for convenient sources of energy. Right. So, you know, if if you're doing your research on a population of people that are already experiencing depression, then it's actually pretty likely that they might be reaching for processed foods that they don't have to cook and wash and chop and prepare. And that also might be higher in sugar and fat and sodium versus someone who's not depressed will be maybe making healthy, balanced meals. Right. And so the research is ongoing, but it seems that people with higher sugar intake as a part of a diet rich in highly processed foods are more likely to experience depression. And that, my friends, is the end of season one of Dietetics After Dark. Oh my goodness, this was a sad episode. I know. (laughs) I feel like we should have ended on a lighthearted note. No, I just meant that this is even more sad because this is oh, yeah. the end of season one. Yeah, it's like quadruple sad. But behind the scenes, yeah, it's not over for us. We will be working hard on getting you a season two, mm-hmm. bigger and better season two. Absolutely. Totally not over for us. Oh my goodness. We have mm-hmm. so much planned. It's a little overwhelming. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to be working hard behind the scenes, getting lots of episodes done, doing research and spreading the word about dietetics after dark. Definitely. And I guess that means we don't have a question for next episode because we haven't actually decided what next episode will be yet. Actually, I might have a question for everyone. Maybe it's more of a statement. I'll frame it like a statement. If you have any topic ideas or anything weird that's nutrition or true crime related that you've heard about or want to learn more about, please email us, send us a DM on Instagram, contact us on our website. We want to hear from you. Because some of the best topic ideas, I'd say all of the best Mm -hmm. topic ideas that we've had come from the people listening. Yeah. So you. Absolutely. Even if you don't think it's that weird, send it to us anyways. Mm -hmm. And your questions, if you have questions about like, hey, I heard this, just send them over. Whatever you're thinking. (laughs) Okay, now we're getting desperate. (laughs) Talk to us. People are just going to be like, today for lunch I had... Okay. We don't want that. And I guess <laughs> that's a wrap. Season one. Good job, Becca. It's a wrap. What a ride. Good job. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is emotional. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <gasps> All right. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dietetics After Dark. You can find all the references and materials used to put this podcast together in our show notes at dieteticsafterdark.com. This is an independently produced podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would rate, review, and subscribe to our show. For more information, follow us on Instagram at Dietetics After Dark. If you have an idea for an episode or segment, email us at dieteticsafterdark at gmail.com. This podcast was recorded and edited by Earworm Radio. We highly recommend their services for all of your podcasting needs. You can learn more about them at earwormradio.com.